Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Hop's Workshop number 30. As always, do say hello in the comments and let me know what railway you represent and I'll say hello to you and you can get your voice on the tape to prove you were here. Hello to Jeff Mesnard, who I think is from the Epping Onger Railway. I'm not 100% sure, but do say hello, let me know what organisation you're from uh, and I'll say hello to you. Hello to Phil, one of our favourite viewers. From the Epping Onga Railway, hello to Matt Simpson from the Bodmin and Wenford, just down the road from me where I am in glorious Devon where it's been raining all day. I used to work in Edinburgh, I lived in Edinburgh for about 18 months and I'm sure I got nicer weather there than I have since I've lived in Devon. Hello to Lucy Millard from the Cholsey and Wallingford Railway and to Paul Milnes from Cholsey. Good evening to Graham from the National Tramway Museum and David Lowe from the Bure Valley Railway. Graham got some fame in hops this week, although I can't remember what it was, but I'm sure you got a mention for something, didn't you, Graham? I can't remember what it was now, though. Hello, Bure Valley Railway. Hello, David. Thank you very much to everyone for tuning in to hops workshop number 30. We've reached the big 30 workshops. Can you believe it uh, that we've hosted over the last couple of years? on a range of hops and SMS related subjects. This is the last SMS workshop for 2022. I will be back with more workshops in the next year, but I don't know exactly what format they will take yet or what they'll be on, but I'm very much open to your views on uh, the shape of the workshops and what you like and what you don't like and what we can do in the future to continue to help you out. What I do know is that the Heritage Railway Safety Service is taking over HOPS SMS workshops and they will be Heritage Railway Safety Service workshops. Um, but they will still be with me and they will still be very similar. Uh, it is just this exercise that I'm sure you all know we are going through of separating out some of our safety services from our software tools. But more about that later. A couple of little final hellos. Hello to Andrew Smith from the Dune Valley Railway and Chris Nesbitt from a very wet Derby and the Ecclesbourne Valley Railway. Yes, I think it is wet absolutely everywhere uh, today. So let's see what we've got in the news before we start on the exciting topic of the management of the risk of change. First thing is Top of the Hops came out yesterday. I did manage to get it out a whole day before the workshop. As you know, I tried to get it out shortly before the workshops and I... Uh, unusually did actually successfully manage to do so this month. So if you haven't already seen it, you can download Top of the Hops uh, from the website. If you have a look in the system updates list, you'll find it there, or you can have a look on Facebook, and I'm pretty sure I provided the download link there and on Twitter, and it contains updates on what goes on in Hops and also other matters of safety and compliance interest for managers of Heritage Railways. If you are a Hops admin and you receive Top of the Hops, then don't forget that as well as being your railway's spy in the Hops camp, you are also Hops's spy in the railway. Uh, so please do forward it on to other managers uh, who may find it interesting. Uh, a couple of other little hops updates for you. First of all, uh, you may have seen that I have overhauled the um, statistics output from Time Register so that you can get much more granular, juicy information about where uh, time is being spent uh, and in what proportions, such as that graph on the right-hand side, the top right-hand side shows the proportion of time registered uh, in each department. And underneath that is the time for the whole year, broken down by department and month. And over the left-hand side uh, is some totals uh, for the year and departments year on year. And where there is more than one year's worth of information, I've provided you with little up and down arrows. I deliberately have not coloured them in red and green because I would not like to suggest whether it is a good thing or a bad thing that more time uh, is being spent. I think if we were going to uh, judge that, we'd have to compare it somehow against the amount of output that was being obtained. Um, so I just put them in black and you can judge for yourself whether you think it's a good thing or a bad thing that the amount of time spent uh, is going up or down. Uh, the last most recent version of Rail Days came out recently, and don't forget you can now have more than one dot on the map, as you can see there on the left-hand side. You can edit the dots on the map in uh, Hops itself in the Services menu and then scroll down to Rail Days 
and you can have a dot per station. And as you can see, you can have small ones and big ones. And the idea is that the big ones are the ones where you want the public to go to and the small ones are the other ones. There's also a new chat facility in Rail Days. I know that the chat facility will not be hugely useful on the first day when fewer people have downloaded the Rail Days app. But as more people download it, as it becomes more useful, we hope that they will. Um, I hope that the chat facility will be useful as a mechanism for facilitating communication between everybody who works on the railway without having to add them all as Facebook friends or download the numbers into your phone or anything like that. And it is one of the many um, sort of children of Hopscoms uh, that we're doing to ultimately replace Hopscom. So it's designed for informal communication. You can message anybody on any railway that you have uh, in common. Um, and of course, you can get it in the Rail Days app as well as on the Hops website. Hops Masterclass is coming soon. The dates have all been published. This is instead of a Hops Roadshow this winter, where in previous years we've come around the country and visited you all. But uh, we thought just for a change, we would bring back Hops Masterclass after an absence of uh, several years, which will be a formal sort of type of training session. There's six different sessions and we repeat each one. So you've got 12 opportunities to attend. Um, and it is formal training, let's say, or as formal as it's going to get training on how hops works and what you should be doing um, to use it properly. And as well as providing a bit of confidence and um, uh, hopefully a bit of skills to some hops admins, hopefully it will also provide railways with the opportunity to demonstrate um, that the staff responsible for using their compliance system um, have been trained uh, to do so properly. So again, you can find the dates and times for Hops Masterclass uh, on the website and in system updates and in all the other places like Facebook and Twitter. Um, there's two sessions uh, for each, or sorry, there's, there's, a, there's two instances of each of the six sessions and they're deliberately timed to make it convenient for employed members of staff and volunteer members of staff and for staff in the UK and staff in Australia. So hopefully with all those different timings, um, there'll be one that's uh, convenient for you. So Hops Masterclass, uh, nearly 50% of the spaces on Hops Masterclass have already been snapped up, by the way. So don't put off uh, booking if you do want to attend, because you might find by the time you get round to it, all the spaces are gone. And as I mentioned earlier, the Heritage Railway Safety Service has now been launched. This is our new scheme. And thank you very much to everybody who's been so positive about uh, what we're up to here. We've had lots of interest from lots of different uh, railways and companies and other organisations about what we're doing. Uh, and it's all very positive. There is a new website, which is what you can see on the left hand side, which just has an overview of some of the services that the Heritage Railway uh, Safety Service will be taking over from HOPS and some of the things that it will be um, developing on of its own uh, in the future. Don't be alarmed, though. Uh, it will not be uh, another hops. It will not be another website where you have to register hundreds of users and keep competence records and things like that. The vehicle through which the services, um, or at least the software services of the Heritage Railway Safety Service, will be delivered will be hops. So if you're already using hops, you're already halfway there. And this is just to make it a little bit clearer as to what's a safety service and what's a software tool to sort of separate this thing out into two distinct uh, brands, I guess. It is the intention, though, that the Heritage Railway Safety Service becomes its own autonomous organisation, as we uh, suggested we would do a couple of years ago, which ultimately will take over the ownership of hops and be a long term um, long-term security for it to make sure that it can it can go on into the future the brochures on the right hand side were posted out to many railways every railway that i could find an address for uh over the last couple of weeks so hopefully you've received your one of those if you haven't feel free to email in uh, and i'll either send you one or email you the pdf or i think you can download the pdf from the website i'll certainly check after this um uh, after this workshop to make sure that you can uh, the only action that we require or, or request from you at the moment is to register who your Heritage Railway Safety Service reps will be. So there's a page within HOPS in the services menu there. You can see on the left-hand side where you can register who your Heritage Railway Safety Service reps will be and also underneath that any other people who you want to add to the mailing list. You can have as many of either of those things uh, as you like. It is administered uh, by permission. It's permission 485. So you can allocate the permission to a group, say, for example, your operations manager group or your driver manager group um, to save having to add them specifically to the, the mailing list. But anybody who isn't um, a member of a group who you want to permanently 
be receiving these updates, you can add them to the Heritage Railway Safety Service mailing list. And in fact, they can add themselves as well. It's completely open to anybody who wants to sign up um, to do so. Uh, one safety circular has been issued since the last workshop, safety circular number 72, on the subject of level crossing risk. And it is just a reminder of the level crossing uh, risk management resources that are available in an earlier HUPS workshop. I think it was workshop number 23 or something like that, uh, where we discussed about how to manage safety at user worked uh, level crossings. As you may have seen, there was a uh, level crossing incident on a heritage railway recently, albeit not a user worked one, but it is a timely prompt to make sure that uh, we are managing our level crossing safely, particularly those uh, that rely on the discipline of the user uh, to maintain safety. Okay, that's the end of the news. You'll be pleased to hear. So, for the last time, here is the news. Sorry, here is the rules uh, of the workshop. Workshop number 30, rule number one. Please join in, as always. Please join in in the comments, ask questions, make comments. It is particularly important that you do so if you disagree with what's being said, because this is not called a lecture, it's called a workshop, and I don't claim to know absolutely everything about the subject matter. Uh, despite what some people might think, um, I'm more than happy for other people to uh, to tell me I'm wrong or to say they've got a better idea. That's what the purpose of this workshop is, is for everybody as far as possible uh, to share what they can so that everybody else uh, can get the benefit. We will upload the video to YouTube afterwards uh, and it will also be uh, it'll remain on Facebook so that um, so that you can see it there. But I have uh, uploaded all the previous workshops to YouTube and you can look at them and play them back uh, and pause them and go away and look at your own documents and then come back to them uh, as you like. Or as one person told me, they like to listen to them in a sort of a podcast style format when driving uh, on their headphones. Uh, so whatever floats your boat, the videos are on YouTube uh, for you to watch afterwards. The aim, as it always has been, is to construct this best practice set of SMS templates to hopefully save us all a bit of duplication and by extension a bit of time and a bit of cost and a bit of best practice and a bit of legwork that we are all otherwise doing and duplicating. But just to confirm my usual disclaimers is I'm certainly not saying that this is what you must do, or at least I try to make very clear where I'm referring to something that is in ROGS, for example, and therefore you must do. Um, and I'm also not saying that this is guaranteed to be suitable for every undertaking. And of course, the responsibility, as always, is yours to make sure that what you choose to take from it is appropriate for your railway, whether that's everything or just one sentence. You can't just change the badge on the top and then say, there we go, that's our SMS. I Oh, that slide's in the wrong order, so I'll just go on to the next slide. I referred to two documents, uh, or I referred to lots of documents, but two principal documents when uh, constructing this uh, template and workshop. They're both from the ORR. One is their website on safety verification for non-mainline transport operators, which you can find on the ORR website. And the other is the ORR's Guide to ROGS, which also contains things about safety verification, which we will get to as we go along. Uh, I'll now go back a slide, back to that little family tree thing that you saw flash up and then go away. I just wanted to remind everybody this sort of standard template that I've been using, uh, standard organisational template that I've been using when I've been making an SMS. Um, I've not referred to the rolling stock manager or the commercial manager or the civil engineering manager or any of those roles. I've just grouped them all as the manager of the business unit. And I know that manager of the business unit is not a railway term or it's not a term that any railway actually uses. And that's deliberate. I deliberately picked it for that reason so that you can say the operations manager on our railway is the manager of the business unit and the rolling stock engineering manager is a manager of the business unit. And all those people can have their own titles for their own business units, but they all know that as far as the SMS is concerned, they are the manager of the business unit. And it's the same in the blue row below. I've called them all head of department. So whether you call your head of guards department the guards inspector or the guards manager or the senior guard or the guards superintendent or whatever you call them, uh, they will be referred to as the head of department and so will all of the other people of, of a sort of equivalent level. And it just makes it a lot, lot easier to manage the SMS rather than having to say guard superintendent slash footplate inspector slash signalling manager where you can just say the head of department uh, and we know the, the level of manager uh, that we're talking about. Uh, 
And I use the example quite a lot. It's exactly the same as on the main line where the rule book refers to the guard, but all different train operating companies call that person a different thing. It might be a conductor or a train manager or any, a, any other job title, but they all know that their job title might be train manager. They follow the rules of the guard. So in this case, you will write to the commercial manager and you will say, congratulations, you're appointed to the commercial manager and you are the manager of the business unit for the commercial business unit. As always, if you don't like it, you can rip it out and change it for your own job titles. But I just wanted to remind everybody of that sort of structure that I've been um, sticking to while I've been building these SMSs. OK, let's go over to the lovely template, as we always do. So here's the Word document. Uh, and if you're an advanced Hop subscriber, then you'll be able to download it from the Hop's website. Um, it, it, not immediately, but uh, within a range of time uh, after this workshop ends. I normally wait a little bit because I normally do get some comments and feedback and spelling mistakes and things like that. So I normally wait a little while at least before uploading it so that hopefully you get the, uh, the best result. Uh, there's a cover page here which you will delete off before you uh, use it. It's headed up with this is not your organization's SMS just to make sure that if somebody finds it either uh, on, a, on a system or lying around on the desk in the office, they don't accidentally think uh, that it's the SMS they're supposed to be following. A little bit about how to use it and copyright and licenses and things like that. Then there's a cover page which you can insert your own logo in. And if you haven't been on a SMS workshop before, whenever there's red text like this, it's stuff where I think you should be changing it for something that is uh, local to you. So in this case, to put your own railway name uh, in here. Of course, you can change any of it as much as you like or, or only um, take small paragraphs or small sentences out of it. Uh, that is completely up to you. But where it's in red is where I really think you should be, uh, you should be changing it. OK, so here we go. Uh, this document details the process for managing risk arising from the process of change and recognition of resultant long term risk. The ORR say it is important that changes of all kinds within organisations are properly planned, that risks are assessed and that consequences are analysed and acted upon. It is essential that organisations take a systematic approach to the management of change and the management of change is a key risk control system within any health and safety management system. So there's a few useful words to pick up on here. First of all is that they say change of all kinds and when I started writing this template I started trying to define what constituted a change and what didn't and it didn't really work. We had to uh, decide that everything was a change uh, and then decide how much risk it imported and therefore what the appropriate controls were uh, for it. So as you'll find when we go through this document, I have, or I'll, 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 um, I'll give you a spoiler, is I've got three levels in here, Procedure A, Procedure B and Procedure C, designed to make sure that the change management system does facilitate people making change at the appropriate level and isn't a blocker to making change. Um, but make sure that changes that do have significant risk are escalated uh, to the required level. I've just noticed that you can tell where I copied the document from because the header still says competence management system. So hang on a second. Change management system. There we go. So all kinds of change are included in this uh, change management system, and we will determine how risky we think that change is and uh, what controls uh, it requires. It also makes clear here that um, it is essential that organisations take a systematic approach to the management of change. And this document seeks to um, deploy that, seeks to define how that's going to work. And when you finish reading it and when we finish going through it, you might think to yourself, gosh, that was a very complicated way of saying we will manage the risk of change. And I have tried to make it, uh, I've tried to use as few words as I can, um, but I've also tried to define quite rigidly what the systematic approach is going to be. And hopefully you'll pretty quickly get the hang of the principles and you won't need to read every word in order to guess what's coming in the next paragraph. OK, so on we go. RM3, good old RM3. Section RCS3 of RM3 defines the best practices and expectations for the management of change. And this states, effective change management ensures that the quantity, frequency and nature of change to assets process, probably should be processes, but I copied that straight off the ORR. Um, or organisation does not adversely affect health and safety management and risk control. All individual changes need to be managed. There we go again. All individual changes need to be managed to prevent adverse impact on the SMS and control of risk. This includes risk arising from the actual process of change as well as the new end state achieved. Appropriate methods of risk assessment should be employed where appropriate. Uh, 
The relevant key indicators from RM3 are copied below, and we will strive to achieve the excellent indicators. However, the ORR has stated, it was here on a HOPS workshop, that it recognises that not all organisations can obtain excellence in every component of RM3, so this will not be the minimum benchmark. And in fact, I think what they actually said was it's extremely rare for anyone to achieve excellence in a particular aspect of RM3. So I've copied it here. I shan't read through every single little bit of uh, RM3. I might just read the bullet points of excellence, though. There is a comprehensive change management process which considers the wider impacts of all types of change. Yes, we have got that. We're reading it now. There is an understanding that change can affect other aspects of an organization's business. This leads to an organizational risk being linked with health and safety risk during and as a result of any change. I hope we've achieved that further down in the document. All staff are familiar with and understand the change management process. Well, you will, of course, upload it to HOPS where the SMS lives and uh, make it available to all staff. Changes lead towards continuous improvement. Well, hopefully we'll never accept a change that's going to lead to a deterioration of performance or risk. Uh, changes which are implemented only ever reduce the organization's overall risk profile. Okay, brilliant. And there is a clear review process in place that assesses the effectiveness of changes as and when they take place. And that will be the last paragraph of the, uh, of the document that we're reading now. So as I said, I won't read absolutely everything to do with RM3, but uh, I thought it was worthwhile copying the, uh, the sections in there because this is almost our definition of what success looks like and what we're trying to achieve. Right, identification of change. The following infrastructure and operational activities will always be considered changes that give rise to new or significantly altered risk by default. So in a minute, this is going to become significant as to which changes uh, give rise to new or significantly altered risk. And these are the changes that we will always consider give rise to new or significantly altered risk until we can prove that they don't. Changes to or introduction of new rolling stock, new locomotives or traction units, new signalling control systems, interlocking systems, or indications given to drivers or others responsible for the operation of trains. Changes to or introduction of new track or points layout, station platforms, platform furniture, or the management of safety at stations. Uh, changes to or introduction of new bridges, structures, and other civil installations. New arrangements at level crossings, including passive level crossings. That's one that don't ones that don't have any active safety arrangements, like user work crossings with gates where the user looks both ways. Changes to or introduction of new permanent speed restrictions, of rule books and other operational instructions, and changes to or resulting in changes to a document in the SMS suite. So, as we talked about when we talked about uh, the SMS overall document, there will be a smallish pointer document at the top of the SMS and then loads potentially hundreds of sub documents and it's up to you really how far you push that as to what you consider is part of the SMS and rigidly controlled and what you consider is not part of the SMS and you're not too worried about um, uh, changes being made to it or, or how it's deployed or controlled and obviously that decision will be driven by the risk or that the document is trying to mitigate. I would say most heritage railways need to push that quite far and you've seen that we've had SMS workshops that have drilled down quite far into the management of competence of duty officers and signalling operations staff and all those sorts of things. Um, because of the nature of a heritage railway where it has a humongous number of staff, many of whom are not paid and are overall doing the equivalent amount of work of a much smaller number of full-time equivalents, the job of managing all that becomes a lot harder and therefore having things written out in the SMS becomes a lot more um, appropriate and a, and a, lot, a lot stronger way of, uh, of managing uh, the railway. So anything that results in a change to an SMS document uh, is going to be considered uh, giving rise to new or significantly altered risk by default. Because I would hope that if I... Uh, if, if I went to the perfect railway that has the perfect SMS and I picked up the SMS and walked out the door with it to another site and then built another railway based on that SMS, I would come out with the same railway. That's how good the SMS should be in defining what we do and how we manage things safely. So if we're going to be changing those documents, then we are going to be giving rise to new or significantly altered risk. The requirement to manage the risk arising from change is not limited to the operational aspects of the railway. It includes all our business activities. The following items will also be considered changes that give, oh dearie me, give rise to new or altered risks by default. 
changes to cash handling or storage or security processes, changes to road traffic arrangements, e.g. access roads, car parks, etc. Changes to building fabric that alter the footprint of the building or its internal walls. Significant electrical installations or alterations, changes to civils or structures or their management processes, or any other activity that changes a critical business process. So remember in RM3 it said this wasn't just about operations, this is about the whole business. Anything that gives rise to a significant risk to the business um, is going to be covered in this same change management uh, process. So there are going to be three procedures, Procedure A, Procedure B and Procedure C. Procedure A applies to all changes and involves a level of internal consultation with the affected department only and is generally managed by the head of department. Procedure B applies to changes that involve staff from other departments and involves an internal consultation with other business units. It is generally managed by the manager of the business unit. And Procedure C involves independent safety verification and applies unless it can be positively demonstrated that neither the process of the change nor the effect of it gives rise to new or significantly altered risk. And the reason I've split it up into these three procedures is to make sure that we don't have to spend years and years discussing the fact that we're going to move the bookshelf to the other side of the room. Because it's really difficult to define what's a change that needs managing, what's a change that needs safety verification. You know, we want to empower heads of departments to make appropriate improvements and changes but we don't want everybody making changes left, right and centre that become totally uncontrolled. And unfortunately, the nature of a heritage railway does lead to that because it generally has lots of little um, groups managing their own affairs and perhaps getting a bit too carried away in what they've got the authority to change. And sometimes we find after an incident, not just in a heritage railway, but on the main line, that a change was applied and at the time it was applied, a change management process wasn't applied and a risk crept in. So ideally, Procedure A will be used um, at the lower end when just a head of department wants to make a little change in their department, all the way up to Procedure C, where it's independent safety verification territory. The separation, oh, this is what I have just said. The separation of this management process into three procedures enables decisions to be made at the appropriate level, ensuring that small changes do not become unnecessarily onerous to manage, but that large changes with new risks are managed appropriately. The title use, titles used in this document refer to the management levels given in the SMS, which remember we referred to on the, um, uh, on the little uh, family tree uh, before we started the template. In all cases, there will be a lead manager. The lead manager may change as the process progresses. As you can imagine, it's going to go up through the procedures and it's going to go up through the levels of management if necessary. Where a change is identified, it will be necessary to apply Procedure A. First of all, this will help identify whether Procedure B and or C is required or not. The outcomes of procedures and decisions on whether subsequent procedures are required may be recorded in meeting minutes or in a separate rationale justification document prepared as part of the change. I realise this is all starting to sound really heavy and you might be turned off from it thinking, oh my goodness, we can't be doing all this every time we want to make a little change. Well, I promise if you stick with it and you follow it all the way through to the end, you'll find that little changes require relatively little, but it is good at identifying when what might be perceived as a little change is actually a big change and shouldn't happen or should uh, be subject to a bit more scrutiny. So procedure A applies in all cases. Any member of staff may propose a change. Where the member of staff is below the level of a head of department, they must write the details of their proposal to the head of department to take forward and manage under this process, and the head of department becomes the lead manager. The head of department must consider, does the proposal involve any of the items given in the identification of change section of this document, you know, such as changes to bridges and signalling systems and things, or does it involve any other new or significantly altered risk? Are any staff or processes from other departments affected? If neither of these are the case, the head of department must consult with staff in their own department if necessary, and the manager of the business unit if necessary. Conduct a risk assessment and proceed with or reject the change, and procedure B and C will not be required. So this is the example of a little change being managed wholly by the head of department. They could have the idea themselves, not deem it necessary to consult with anybody in the department or the manager of the business unit, conduct the risk assessment and then proceed with the change. And that would be absolutely fine. And that's deliberately designed for the small things that we would expect and like and encourage um, a head of department to be continuously involved in um, improving. Um, 
if if either of the above is true, that is, it does affect people or processes from other departments, or it is identified in the identification of change section or involves other new or significantly altered risk, if either of those is true, then the head of department must instead refer to the manager of the business unit to take forward and manage under procedure B. The manager of the business unit becomes the lead manager. And I've even drawn you a little flowchart. Does the proposal involve any of the items given in the identification of change section of this document or any other new or significantly altered risk? Yes, procedure B and C applies. Or no, does the proposal affect staff from any other department? Yes, then procedure B applies. Or no, procedure A applies. So as I've said a few times now, this is a very long-winded way of saying, as long as you confirm that nobody else is affected and it doesn't significantly alter risk, you can make the change. I've deliberately left in there, though, wherever I put it, conduct a risk assessment. And again, that sometimes draws a bit of a sigh, but hopefully, especially if you use the lovely HOPS risk assessment system, it's a relatively quick process of ticking some boxes and typing some things in on the screen to conduct that risk assessment, getting it checked by another person to make it really robust, and then pressing submit, and that's all that's required. But I promise you that if you make this change, no matter how small or in insignificant it might be, changing the colour of the pens from blue to black, if that leads to an incident at any point in the future, I promise you, you will get asked, where was the risk assessment that you did when you made this change? And even if the risk assessment is only two lines long and it says we weren't able to identify any risks, you've now complied with your responsibility to do risk assessments. It's always a requirement. Um, so the way I look at it is I feel our job as HOPs and as managers on Heritage Railways is just to normalise that risk assessment process and to make it as easy as we possibly can for staff to do. OK, so there's procedure A. And so for small things that don't go any further than procedure A, that's it. That's the end of the change. The head of department can now go ahead and make the change. Procedure B. Where the proposal reaches the manager of the business unit because it involves new or significantly altered risks or affects staff or processes in more than one department, the manager of the business unit becomes the lead manager. So you can see this change is wider than just the department in which it originated. And so it's going to go have to go up a management level to somebody who sort of encompasses the entire um, area of change, or at least can liaise with people who are responsible for everyone that's going to be affected. Note, it is also possible for a more senior manager to be the lead manager. For example, if the more senior manager is the person who comes up with the idea in the first place, it might not always be appropriate to shove it down the structure just for it to be shoved back up again. We'll come to that in a moment. So the lead manager must determine whether the proposal involves any of the items given in the identification of change section of this document or does it involve any other new or significantly altered risk. Now hopefully um, the, uh, the, the, the head of department who had this um, proposed change in procedure A will have done a fair amount of the legwork here and will only have escalated it up to procedure B when they've determined that it does have those things. But the manager of the business unit must take a, a view on this as well and must take a, a sort of a more senior management level uh, view um, where perhaps they might be more qualified to make that risk-based uh, judgment. Uh, Daniel Timms from the Avon Valley Railway has asked, would you consider the risk assessment you mentioned sufficient that you'd undertaken procedure A or should it be captured in a different way? So I think if this question is about just how we record risk assessments, then as long as they're recorded, it is up to you to determine how they're going to be recorded. So obviously I would love you to put them in hops, but if you just want to write in an email, for example, that says, I've looked at this, I've identified that, I've determined this, and therefore I'm going to do that, at least that is recorded. Hopefully that email can be saved as a PDF and stored somewhere in the file of change management processes that you've implemented. But as I say, I'm trying my best not to make this too onerous for tiny little changes. Um, obviously, if the change was, was massively significant, I'd expect a lot more in the way of recording of risk assessments. But for stuff that survives under Procedure A, I think a few lines will do the trick. Um, because by definition, if it's going to be managed under Procedure A, it's not significantly altering or adding in um, new risk. So hopefully the risks involved are either already covered, because then there's no new risks, or there just are so few risks that there's nothing else to record. Uh, so the lead manager will determine uh, whether there's new or significantly altered safety risk. And if so, pause procedure B 
and refer to the lead manager or the general manager, if they are the lead manager, to agree the process by which procedure C will be carried out. Do not carry out any more of procedure B until the details of procedure C are agreed on. So just to clarify what's going on here, this has come up to procedure B and immediately we've identified that there is new or altered risk, in which case it has to go to C and we'll find out why it has to go to C when we get there. But if you're familiar with the documents that I flashed up on the screen earlier, the ORR's Guide to Managing Change and Safety Verification, you will see that those are the exact words that define when safety verification is required, which is what we're going to see in Procedure C. So the first thing we'll do when we get hold of it at Procedure B is we'll say, is this actually suitable for Procedure B? If not, it'll have to go to Procedure C. The lead manager will also determine which departments, staff or processes are affected. And where the lead manager is the lead, sorry, where the lead manager is the manager of the business unit for the departments, then they will consult with those heads of departments by sending details of the proposed change and seeking their views on the risks and costs and benefits. So these heads of departments are likely to be direct reports of this manager of the business unit. This is, for example, the operations manager is the lead manager and the departments affected are signalling and guards, or the engineering manager is the lead manager and the departments affected are P-Way and S&T. They just refer with their own heads of departments who, who they obviously refer with regularly anyway. The heads of departments must consult with the staff in their own department if necessary and give a response to the manager of the business unit detailing how the proposed change will affect the department, especially highlighting if there are any new or significantly altered risks. Where the other departments are not in the business unit for which the lead manager is the manager of the business unit, then the lead manager must consult with the managers of those other business units by sending details of the proposed change, seeking their views on the risks and costs and benefits. The receiving manager of the business unit must carry out procedure B in their own business unit, consulting with heads of departments when necessary. And the paragraph in yellow is the same as the one above as to what the heads of departments will do. They will consult with their own staff and then respond to the manager of the business unit. Uh, the manager of the business unit will correlate a single response on behalf of the business unit to the lead manager detailing how the proposed change will affect the business unit, especially highlighting if there are any new or significantly altered risks. So again, that sounds like a lot because there's a lot of long words in there, but really, if I put it to a real-life example, if somebody in the signalling department wants to make a change, the signalling engineering department, let's say, and they want to change the format or display of a signal or make it taller or replace it with a colour light or something like that. They will identify in procedure A that other departments are going to be affected, such as the drivers. They will refer it up to the manager of the business unit. The manager of the business unit might say, well, there's no new or significantly altered risk here, but I am going to have to think about who else is affected. Ah, the drivers department, well, they're not one of mine. So I will have to liaise with the manager of the operations business unit, let's say, and ask them to liaise with their heads of department. So I'll sort of shove it across to that business unit. They will have a little consultation and then they will give me back one response on behalf of the business unit. The SMS presumes that managers of the business unit will have a detailed understanding of the activities and the risks, if not the technical skills, taking place in the departments in their own business unit, at least equal to the level of the head of department, but not of those departments in other business units. Hence, the other managers of the business units will convert the potentially technical responses from their heads of departments into a higher level risk-based response to the lead manager. So here I'm saying that I would expect the operations manager of a railway to understand in detail the activities and risks going on in the signalling department, in the guards department, in uh, any other operations related department. And I would expect the commercial manager to know in detail the exact activities and tasks that are going on in the shop and the cafe and the buffet and the TTIs and all those things, but not necessarily to the same level of detail what's going on in other business units. So to go back to our real life example, if the engineering manager is taking forward this change that has been proposed from the signal engineering department and he sends it over to the operations business unit to get some response, operations might come up with all sorts of jargon that the engineering manager doesn't necessarily need to know or understand or have experience of. And that's why we would expect the manager of the operations business unit to sort of convert it into some risk-based uh, response rather than just lots of... Um, uh, operations related technicalities. 
The All of the above may, for example, be conducted by email and correlated into one document by the lead manager. We're not expecting all this to take place on headed paper with signatures and all that sort of stuff. It's not designed to be that level of formality, but all of the responses that um, the lead manager obtains, either from their own heads of departments or from other managers of business units, can just be copy and pasted into one document that just sets out the position to make sure that we have demonstrated all of the input that we've considered uh, in risk assessing this proposed change. It should be remembered that the consultation procedure is not an instrument for any members of staff involved in the process to block a change or to determine that they don't want it to happen. It is only about identifying risk so that a risk assessment can be conducted and the lead manager can make a decision on whether to proceed with the change or whether further procedures are required. So this isn't about obtaining unanimous agreement for the change. This is about giving everyone the opportunity to present what they feel the risks are using their professional judgment and their technical skills for the job that they do into one risk assessment that the lead manager will make a decision on. Now, you can have all sorts of dispute procedures if you really want to. If you want to allow people to block things, they'll have to obviously go up a level of management or implement the um, concern raising and escalation policy, in fact, would be a good response to that. <coughs> But um, I definitely didn't want to implement uh, any sort of procedure that required unanimous universal agreement, because as we know, that's almost impossible to obtain. But we do want to be able to demonstrate that everyone's had the opportunity to um, state risks, and therefore we've done everything we can to identify them by asking everybody. Note, if a manager of a business unit has a proposal for change that only affects one department, they may just send it straight to the head of department to start the process at procedure A. And as we've said that managers of the business units are expected to be uh, to have detailed uh, knowledge of what's going on in the department, it's highly likely that managers of the business unit will come up with brilliant ideas for how to improve things. But just because the idea came from the mind of a manager of business unit does not necessarily mean that the whole of procedure B should have to apply. He can just ring up the guards manager or something and say, oh, I've had a brilliant idea. Why don't all guards wear name badges or something like that? and the uh, guards manager can just take it forward under procedure A. Note two, if a manager more senior than a manager of the business unit has a proposal for change, then they may send it to the relevant head of department or manager of the business unit to start at procedure A or B, or they may carry out procedure B themselves as lead manager, treating all the business units as other business units. Because remember we said if the departments affected or the staff in departments affected were not managed by the lead manager, then they would have to go to those other managers of the business units. So in this case, if we imagine, for example, the general manager has a brilliant idea, the change management process has still got to apply, and they might say, well, my brilliant idea is to do with track, so I'm going to give it to the, uh, the P-Way manager and tell them I'd like them to follow the change management process and see what happens. Or they might decide it's such a big thing or that uh, they have the skills to manage it and they say I'm going to carry out procedure B and I will consult with all the managers of the business units of the departments that are uh, going to be affected by this and that's why much further up we said somewhere here it is possible for a more senior manager to be the lead manager. That's also why we've said here um, that if you identify that the proposal um, does give rise to new or significantly altered risks, then pause procedure B and refer to the lead manager. And obviously, if you are the lead manager, that's no good. So if you are the lead manager, then you'll refer to the general manager or whatever you call them that's the level above the manager of the business unit. Decisions on whether procedure C is required. Both the risk arising from the change itself and the risk arising from the result of the change will be considered. And it's important to recognise that those are two separate things, as the examples uh, are about to show. For example, installing a new platform, when we have installed many of these before, may not be new or significantly increased risk from the last time it was done. And a review of the risk assessments might reveal no new or altered risks in the building process. But the result of the change, the new platform, introduces a lot of new risk, PTI interface, dispatch arrangements, etc., meaning that the project will require procedure C. The long-term effect of the change, the permanent effect of the change, has introduced a lot of new risk and significantly altered existing risk, so it will have to go to procedure C. It can't survive at procedure B, where it is a low-level change that just happens to span across many departments and so is being managed by the manager of the business unit. 
Example two, replacing a bridge gives significant risk in the construction process, and most construction projects require very specific safety management and planning, which means that even though the result of the change, the new bridge, will be the same as the old one and no new risk will arise, the project will require Procedure C because of the significant new and altered risks during the change process. So that one hits Procedure C because of the risk arising during the change rather than as a result of it. Example three, replacing a semaphore signal like for like with no changes to the format or meaning or interlocking. Replacing signals is something we have done many times before and have a well-established process and risk assessment. Provided each job is confirmed as having no new or altered risks, this project will only require procedure A and B, A and or B, as there is no new risk arising from the work and the result will be no change from what was there previously. So hopefully those three examples give some good um, pointers as to the sort of things that might trigger this to require procedure C. So just before we go on, just to confirm, when we arrive at procedure B, because it can't be handled completely within the department, the lead manager will first of all say, does this involve significant new or altered risk? And if it does, then we'll go no further with procedure B and we'll jump straight to procedure C. But if it doesn't, then we'll carry on with all this stuff about asking other managers of other business units what they think uh, and so on. Oh, and I've made you some lovely diagrams. I'd forgotten this. I do like uh, a nice flow chart here and there. So this is a flow chart showing procedure B. We start over here at the original head of department, identifies that a change cannot be dealt with under procedure A. So it goes up to the manager of the business unit, who becomes the lead manager, determines that procedure B is appropriate, or obviously if it isn't, don't follow the rest of this flow chart. Then the arrows go two ways. First of all, they consult with the heads of departments uh, in departments in their own business unit. Those heads of departments consult with staff in the department if necessary. Heads of departments respond to the manager of the business unit. And it also goes this way, upwards. I don't know if you can actually see my mouse pointer on the, um, on the broadcast, so I'm sorry if you can't, but uh, from the second box where it says manager of the business unit pr uh, determines whether procedure B is appropriate, they will also consult with the managers of the business units where departments are not in their own business unit. The other managers of the business units will consult with the relevant heads of departments in their departments. Heads of departments will consult with staff if necessary, respond to the manager of their own business unit, and the manager of the business unit correlates the responses into one on behalf of the business unit. So you can see it's a sort of a mirror image. The manager of the business unit deals with their own heads of departments and gets other managers of other business units to deal with the heads of departments in their um, business units. The other managers of the business unit respond to the lead manager and the lead manager considers all the responses, conducts a risk assessment and determines whether or not procedure C is required. And I think I have said it somewhere in this document, or if not, then I should have done and I shall add it in, that the lead manager can't proceed until he gets the responses that he has requested or they have requested. So to use our real life example again, if the engineering business unit manager requests that the operations business unit manager gives a response, then they've just got to sit there and wait patiently until the operations manager of the business unit uh, gives their response, then uh, the process cannot carry on. And that's to make sure that we don't get a scenario where a disaster happens and one manager says, well, I asked the other manager and they didn't bother to respond. The absence of a response does definitely not uh, confirm the absence of risk. So we've got to have a positive confirmation. If another manager of the business unit or head of department determines that there is no risk relevant to them, then they just reply and say that. I've looked at this and I cannot identify any new or significantly altered risks or cost benefits that aren't worth it or anything like that. Um, mm -mm. Oh, thank you, Lucy, for pointing out that you can see the mouse pointer. That's very helpful. Right, so let's scroll down a little bit more. The decision on whether Procedure C is required will be recorded in the outcomes of Procedure A and B to demonstrate that this decision has been proactively taken. Example, procedure to re sorry, proposal to repaint the station from blue to green. At some point, this will be written down, even, even if it's just in emails discussing you know, backwards and forwards between what we propose to do and what paint we're going to use. At some point some paragraphs like this need to be written, preferably underneath where it defines what the change is going to be, so that you can in the future demonstrate um, that you actively took the decision and you didn't just say, 
well, it's obvious there's no risk because that's not acceptable. Uh, Daniel Timms, again, thank you very much, Daniel, for asking all the excellent questions, has asked uh, how we can implement this process or achieve any change if you're missing a key head of department or the knowledge or skill set required from a similar post. Is the risk deemed then too great because it's unknown or does all changes related to that department then stop while you spend a few months trying to fill the post? Well, I don't think it's either of those, if I'm honest. I think by definition, there is always a de facto head of department and it just escalates up the tree until it reaches a post that is filled because there is no absolution of our health and safety responsibilities. We are always responsible for them in the Health and Safety at Work Act. And if there is no head of signalling staff, then by definition, the operations manager of the business unit is the head of department for uh, the signalling staff. And if there is no head of the operations business unit, then apart from being pretty concerned about who's actually managing the place, and I, I mean that genuinely, if there's two consecutive posts missing, you really have to ask yourself, is, is this place being managed? But by default, it will go up to the general manager. And if there's no general manager, it will go up to the directors who are stated in Section 37 of the Health and Safety at Work Act as being ultimately responsible. Um... Now, it may mean, I suppose, that um, the same person is carrying out two roles in this process. And as you'll remember from when we did the concern raising and escalation uh, process, we put in a few little loopholes to make sure that that couldn't um, reduce the effectiveness of the process. And I think here we're just going to have to say that the same thing applies, that if there isn't a person to jump to, you have to jump up to the next person and uh, er er all of the subsequent steps will be one, one uh, management level higher in the process. Uh, right, so procedure to, oh gosh, proposal to repaint the station from blue to green. We will detail the change and then at some point in an email or a document or just something that we can hold up in court to prove that we actively took the decision, a reference to the SMS change procedure. We are well practiced in repainting station buildings and the process for doing so is already documented and risk assessed, such as cost and working at height and exclusion zones and loan working and things. A review of the existing risk assessment applied to the tasks involved in the change proposed revealed no new tasks or risks that weren't already adequately managed. The result of the change will be a different colour of the station building. No new or altered risk was identified from this permanent change. But procedure B will be required to ensure that we, the building department, have not overlooked any risks arising in other departments from this change. Provided nothing is identified in Procedure B, the proposed change does not give rise to any new or significantly altered risk and therefore will be managed under Procedure A and B of the SMS change procedure only and Procedure C will not be required. Another example, proposal to convert Farm Hill user work crossing to user work crossing with telephones. Again, details of change. And remember I said right at the start that the level of change management and level of risk assessment should be proportional to the risk. And perhaps repainting the station from blue to green, especially if they're fairly innocuous colours of shades of blue and green, probably doesn't require an awful lot of uh, documentation in terms of uh, managing the, the risks associated with the change. Uh, if you're converting a user work crossing to a user work crossing with telephones, then I would imagine lots and lots of lovely paperwork that you can put on the weighing scales to demonstrate all of the lovely risk that you took into account uh, while doing this. Anything to do with level crossings, um, I would say please have lots of lots of documentation. SMS change procedure, we are well practiced in installing telephones and the process for doing so is already documented and risk assessed, such as electricity at work and loan working and publication of instructions and liaising with landowners, etc. A review of the existing risk assessment and method of change proposed revealed no risks that weren't already adequately managed. The result of the change will be a different method of working to the level crossing which is new to this railway as there are no other user worked crossings with telephones. Several new risks were identified with the permanent result of the change, e.g. maintenance of the telephone equipment, training and competence of signalling staff in giving users permission to cross, risk of human error when giving users permission to cross. What will happen if somebody rings up to cross when the signal box is unmanned? How will trains operate when the signal box is closed, e.g. engineering trains? How will we know if the telephone fails and what action will be taken? Change of user behaviour with new equipment and new signage required. 
as the permanent effect of the proposed change give ri- gives rise to a significantly altered risks than has been managed on this railway before, the change will require procedure C of the SMS change management procedure to be applied. So these things in boxes are examples of literally the wording I would expect to be written between those roles as they're discussing the um, the change management procedure. If it's all in your head, it really doesn't count. And again, I can promise you from hard-earned experience uh, that if you're sitting on the opposite side of the table to the ORR and they ask you a question and you give them an answer, they ask, where's it written down? And you say it isn't, then it doesn't count. So at long last, we have arrived at procedure C. Um... Procedure C is applied where a proposed change will give rise to new or significantly altered risk. So no matter how or where the change proposal started, if it gives rise to new or significantly altered risk, it will find itself almost immediately at Procedure C. And that's because that's defined in ROGS as requiring to be managed in a certain way. Where a manager of the business unit identifies that procedure C is required, they will pause procedure B and refer to the lead manager or to their own manager if they are the lead manager, e.g. the general manager. The lead manager and the general manager will agree the method by which procedure C will be carried out. The factors that require procedure C trigger the ROG's requirement for safety verification to take place. Safety verification. The railway will appoint an independent, competent person and assist in forming and overseeing a written scheme of safety verification for the proposed change. The magnitude of the safety verification process should be proportional to the risk involved. And I really can't stress that highly enough, that you can almost do more harm than good than if you've got a 100-page risk assessment for uh, putting up a bookcase. Of course, the opposite is also true. A one-page risk assessment is no good if you're installing a new passing loop with signals and a platform and a new station and a car park and all those other things. The magnitude of the safety verification process really should be proportional to the risk involved. I also want to just go off on a little tangent here about independent competent person um, and that role. And that is the exact term that is used in the in the ORR documentation. And the independent competent person is somebody who conducts safety verification assessments. And unfortunately, I see quite a lot of use of this term independent competent person in the wrong way when I go around to railways. They go, oh, we get Bill in. He's our independent competent person to assess drivers or to pass out people or whatever. And I always sort of try and have this discussion to say, oh, my goodness me, well, Okay, there are ways and means of having external assessors, but please, please don't call them independent competent persons because I think it just it just shows a lack of understanding of what an independent competent person is. So if you have independent competent persons coming into your railway doing assessments other than safety verification, I would strongly recommend that you give them a different title. Um, and another day we can go into the pros and cons of allowing external assessors uh, to assess competence in the railway. Uh, I won't go into that now, uh, apart from to say that the people doing so are not independent, competent persons um, in this respect, and therefore I, I don't think we should be calling them that. Uh, right, so here's a flowchart for procedure C, where the general manager takes over the lead manager role. Because if I just go back up here before I went off on that tangent, you remember I said uh, the lead manager and the general manager will agree the method by which procedure C will be carried out. And that might be that the general manager sort of takes over if it's a significant uh, change. So it starts down here in the bottom left, consider where the manager of the business unit considers all the responses, conducts the risk assessments and determines whether procedure C is required. And if you remember, that was the last square, the last box of the previous flowchart that we looked at, the procedure B flowchart. But this is procedure C. So the next box, the manager of the business unit determines that procedure C is required. And immediately it goes straight up here in pink to the general manager or whatever you call your boss above the manager of the business units. The general manager will discuss with the lead manager how procedure C will be done. In this example, the general manager is going to become the lead manager. In the next example, the manager of the business unit will stay the lead manager. It will depend exactly on the nature of the change and how wide the effect is and what the level of risk is as to whether the general manager or another senior manager perhaps might want to take on responsibility for being the lead manager for the change or whether the manager of the business unit is suitably skilled and experienced to do it themselves. In this case, the general manager is going to become the lead manager. And this goes two ways again. Firstly, they appoint an independent competent person, and we'll come on in a second to how they go about doing that. 
And the independent competent person working with whoever the lead manager is devises a written scheme of safety verification to verify that the proper safety processes and proper risk management uh, sort of protocols are being followed to manage the risk associated with this change. Also from this lead from this box where the general manager becomes the lead manager, they will consult with managers of the business units not already involved. Now, um, it may well be, let's say, that a change is proposed and it's too big for procedure A, so it goes for procedure B. The manager of the business unit at procedure B does not identify that there's new or significant risk, so puts it out to some but not all of the other managers of the business units. And one of those managers of the business units comes back and says, aha, here's something that affects my business unit that you haven't thought of and it's new or significantly altered risk. So the lead manager says, oh, right, OK, well, pause procedure B then. We need to go to procedure C. Procedure C takes place and I've determined obviously you can ignore me if you want, that all managers of the business units should then be involved. I don't imagine any railway, even the biggest of railways, is going to have more than four or five managers of the business units, maybe six at an absolute push. So it's not an onerous thing to send an email to six people saying, we're going through procedure C for a proposed change. Here are the details of the change. Please either reply to say, you can't see any problems with it or consult with your heads of departments and see if they've got any problems and then just come back to me with whatever you think the um, the issues are. I decided that all managers of the business units should be involved if the change is so significant that it goes to procedure C to make sure that we have active evidence that we have done everything reasonable to identify risks. We've gone to all the managers of the business units and said, please, will you identify risks in this proposed change? rather than just us taking the view on, oh, well, it doesn't affect commercial, so we won't ask them, which could happen up to procedure B. And I think it's reasonable to happen up to procedure B. Otherwise, managers of the business units will be absolutely flooded in emails about change requests. But procedure C is obviously something quite significant. And again, I can imagine even the biggest of heritage railways that we have, certainly here in the UK, if there are three or four things a year that require procedure C, then I think that's you know, that's quite a lot. And I imagine most railways will be down into the ones and zeros of things that require uh, safety verification uh, in a year. So the general manager becomes the lead manager, consults with the managers of the business units not already involved. Those managers of the business units consult their heads of departments and the heads of departments consult the staff if necessary. Uh, they respond to the manager of their business unit. The manager of the business unit correlates the responses into one on behalf of the business unit and responds back to the lead manager, who is, of course, working with the ICP on devising the written scheme of safety verification. So it ends up in the same place up here in the top right hand side. I've written this out in quite a verbose way to try and make really clear what the expectation is. You might decide, for example, that actually the general manager is going to go directly to all the heads of departments, especially if you're not a humongous railway and everybody knows each other and there aren't a huge number of heads of departments, you might decide that, um, that that's the way it's going to work for you. Um, but I quite like this sort of structure where it goes up the tree as far as it needs to and then it comes down again and it only goes up higher and higher if it can't be dealt with at each, at each previous level. So hopefully, oh, I had to put this one on its side, but don't worry, I did uh, foresee this because I have uh, made one that's the right way up for you. Um, this is the procedure C where the manager of the business unit remains the lead manager or whoever it was who was the lead manager before remains the lead manager. So at the end of procedure B, consider all the responses and conduct risk assessments and determine whether procedure C is required. Determine that procedure C is required. Up to the general manager discusses with the lead manager how procedure C will be done. And then it comes back down here again into the yellow. Manager of the business unit remains lead manager, appoints the ICP, who will devise the written scheme of safety verification. And because the manager of the business unit is remaining the lead manager, they will then go to all the managers of the business units, all of them, because it's procedure C. Um, they will consult with their heads of departments who will consult with the staff if necessary, report back, and it ends up being correlated and in, fed into the written scheme of safety verification. David from the Bure Valley has pointed out um, ORR Guidance Annex 3 
gives lots of examples of changes where safety verification is unlikely to be required to help you sanity check your judgment and avoid safety verification when it's not needed. Brilliant. Okay, I must have either forgotten or never known that, so that's really helpful. I shall give that one a like. Oh, I might. Oh, no. Like. No, I can't do it. Ha! Well, I do like it. Oh, there we go. Um, so that is really useful to save uh, wasting time on safety verification where it's not needed. However, I would also add that if your internal risk assessment reaches the stage where safety verification is required and then um, uh, that document from the ORR says that it isn't, just make sure that your procedure B is really, really robust. Otherwise, you might subsequently have to demonstrate why you identified so many risks you thought it would go to procedure C and then didn't do safety verification. Uh, Daniel Timms has said, I would be quite keen to learn more about what the written scheme of verification could look like and how to work out if it's appropriate. A few times I've engaged with ICPs. It seems war and peace is the default for anything, which is hard to challenge from the requester's point of view, as it is what the ICP says goes. Ah, right, OK. Well, yes, the ones I've seen have been a bit war and peace. And I must admit, I'm writing one at the moment, and it is quite a few pages long uh, for a heritage railway. Um, but it's not the case, it is definitely not the case that whatever the ICP says goes. You have to work together on it, and the ICP has to challenge the railway, but the railway can push back against the ICP. And there is absolutely no obligation on the railway whatsoever to adopt everything that the ICP recommends. It's just you should have some pretty good justification as to why you're not doing that uh, if the ICP has recommended it. Um, and in fact, what we're about to read now, which I've lifted out of either ROGS or the ORR's Guide to ROGS, sort of goes into that uh, in a bit more detail. But I would like to say that the written scheme of safety verification is a justification document to say, here's a risk, here's what we think about it, here's what the outcome is, here's a risk, here's what we think about it, here's what the outcome is, here's how the project is going to be delivered in a safe way. It's sort of a, it's almost like an SMS in itself, but uh, on a much smaller level. And I think each um, written scheme of safety verification is going to be um, almost unique um, in uh, in its format and in how it's laid out because it's got to be fit for purpose. Um, but don't forget also that although you might find it hard to challenge, and I can say don't find it hard to challenge, and you know that doesn't make it any 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 easier. Um, the ICP is there to help you. The ICP is not there to catch you out. And if the ICP finds something and says, oh, I think it should be blue, and you thought, oh, we were going to paint it red, then that's the prompt to have a discussion and consider all the risks together so that the safety verification scheme can say, we considered red and we considered blue, here are the pros and cons, and we eventually settled on blue for this reason, and here's the risk assessment written in words rather than numbers, perhaps, uh, that accompanies it. Uh, David Lowe has pointed out that a safety verification scheme that has been written for him has already been useful for answering questions from the ORR showing that we had already anticipated the issue. Excellent. Right, so back to the template. Uh, is it on the screen? Yes, it is. Uh, here is some uh, extracts from ROGS about some of those things that we were just discussing. Safety Verification ICP Involvement. The ORR Guide to ROGS 2008 4.2. The ICP does not approve vehicles or infrastructure for placing into service, nor do they have a legal duty to sign off projects. And that's really important. This is not like the pre-ROGS days where the HMRI came along and said either yes or no. All the risk is on the duty holder, and the ICP is just there to help out, to help you follow the proper processes to make sure that you've considered everything. It is ultimately all on the duty holder as to whether uh, the change takes place or not. And that is one of the main reasons why uh, you don't have to follow everything the ICP says and you can challenge them and they can challenge you and it should be a collaborative process done together with meetings, not just remotely and what the ICP says goes. The ICP's task is to help operators devise and carry out an effective safety verification, mainly by checking the operator's arrangements based on information provided by the operator. The operator of the transport system, not the ICP, is responsible for ensuring new or altered rolling stock or infrastructure is introduced and operated safely. The operator must consider the views or recommendations of the ICP, but may challenge them and ultimately reject them if they wish. The ORR expects operators to work with ICPs to overcome any differences of view, but the ORR can provide advice if necessary. So hopefully that answers the question. Hopefully it never gets to the stage where it's absolutely dig heels in and we totally disagree. 
Hopefully, if the ICP and the duty holder disagree, they continue to discuss and discuss and discuss and discuss and consider risk and consider risk and consider risk until they reach a professional agreement on, on what, is the, uh, what is the best way forward. This is another reason why I don't like it when railways who have external assessors say all oh, the ICP is going to do this or do that or pass somebody out because it is never the ICP who, um, who sort of signs on the dotted line. It is always the duty holder who is responsible for what's going on. And of course, they can use the fact that they've used an ICP as part of their process and as part of their defence um, but ultimately it's all on the duty holder and that's another reason why I don't quite like this idea of people coming in from other railways assessing guards and things like that uh, being called ICPs because I think it's just too messy. ROG Schedule 4, Part 1, the arrangements for the selection, appointment and retention of the competent person which, ar uh, yeah, which arrangement should provide, should at least provide for all the words are in there somewhere, you can rearrange them into a coherent sentence the appointment of the competent person at an early stage in the design selection process. So this isn't just somebody who turns up on the final day when it's all been installed. They should be involved throughout the lifespan of the proposed change. The involvement of the competent person in establishing of the criteria to be applied in the verification process and the design selection process and the communication to the competent person of information necessary for the proper implementation or revision of the verification scheme, which information is necessary in order for the competent person to undertake the verification. So those three things, A, B and C, are what the arrangements for the independent competent person should provide for, and I would recommend that when you appoint the independent competent person, which you will do in writing, that you will state what the uh, how the arrangements meet those three things. Um, so you might say your point of contact is blah, and that is the person within the railway from whom you can obtain whatever information you want. ROG Schedule 4, the arrangements for the examination and testing of new or altered vehicles or infrastructure, which arrangements should at least provide for. So this is what the arrangements uh, should include. The means of controlling risks that arise during the carrying out of any tests or trials prior to placing into service and the standards and criteria to be applied in the verification process. Now, earlier on, Dan asks, uh, what would one of these uh, written schemes of verification look like? Well, if I was writing a written scheme of verification, I would be taking many, if not all, of these things as headers and then writing a paragraph or more underneath each one to say how we comply with this. And this last one, B, the standards and criteria to be applied to the verification process, I think will be the majority of the whole rest of the document. It's worth mentioning about standards, and I think that comes up again uh, later, uh, incidentally, that um, there are lots of good resources, let's say, with the word standard written on them, out there that apply to the mainline railway, either now or in history. And there's no obligation on um, heritage railways to follow those sort of British Rail um, standards, but there is a lot of useful information in there, a lot of uh, designs that you can start from, um, which would certainly be better than trying to reinvent the wheel if something's been around for 100 years, but there's no obligation to follow them. There is, of course, an obligation on us to follow stuff that's laid down in legislation, like signing for level crossings and things like that. But uh, to take a really good example, if you've been to Porth Maddock on the uh, Festiniog Railway, you'll see that their signals have got sort of LED lights in that show uh, red and green because the signal um, semaphore signals only have one lens in. And that's a really good example of not following the main line process for what shape and colour a signal should be and following what's appropriate for the, uh, for the change that you want to make. And in that case, it was an aesthetic uh, thing, but with um, appropriate safety precautions applied to it uh, for the present day. Uh, so it's a really good example of saying we don't have to follow the standard of what a semaphore signal looks like on the main line. We're going to do our own thing as long as you can obviously uh, demonstrate that you're managing the risks uh, appropriately. And uh, I hope I won't be um, uh, causing any problems here by saying, but I would really hope that when the Festiniog first introduced those signals, they went through some sort of change management process to determine what colour the lenses would be and when the lights would change colour and all those things, and I'd be fairly sure that they did. Uh, David has pointed out again, thank you, uh, if you don't follow uh, a relevant standard, be prepared to say why. Yes, absolutely, yes, yeah, I would agree with that. Um, because, let's face it, those standards uh, developed in the way they did for a reason. 
Rock Schedule 4, Part 5, the arrangements are for communicating the matters contained in subparagraphs 1 to 4 of this schedule, which are the ones above, to an appropriate level in the management system of the transport operator or responsible person, as the case may be. So communication and what the sort of equivalent of the escalation process uh, is going to be. Right, so that was a load of stuff out of ROGS, which I think was useful, especially since some questions were asked before I got to this page that it has now answered, to just clear up some myths about ICPs and what they do and what they don't do and what safety verification is and what it isn't. Implementation. The lead manager and the general manager, again, replaced with job title of a person above manager of the business unit, will re-familiarise themselves with the ORR guidance on safety verification. And I'm pleased to say that one of those links, I think... Um, <laughs> OK, well, Pete Edwards earlier on uh, gave a link to uh, a website and I, I saw it and I thought, oh, I think that's one of the links I've got. As it turns out, it isn't. <laughs> but uh, I'll either add it or I'll find that that is one of the documents linked from uh, one of these links. In fact, I think it is one of the PDFs linked from that first link, safety verification for non-mainline transport operators. But as I said earlier, I don't think that Procedure C is something that we're going to be doing very frequently at all, and so I thought it was relevant to put here as a requirement in the implementation of Procedure C that the lead manager and general manager, who are going to be working together on how Procedure C is implemented, re-familiarise themselves with the not-too-great um, amount of information in those um, documents. I mean to say there's not hundreds of pages, there's an appropriate amount of information and it's worth refreshing. They will agree whether the manager of the business unit will continue as the lead manager and make arrangements for the appointment of an ICP and for safety verification to take place, or whether a more senior manager will become the lead manager. And again, that could be because of um, maybe management um, experience and skill, or it could be because of technical experience and skill, or it could just be that the risks involved and the impact involved is so great that it wants to be managed um, at a higher level in the business. If the impact is so wide across so many business units, if you're going to be re-gauging your 20-mile-long heritage railway to become a 15-inch gauge railway from standard gauge, then I think that should go to a pretty senior level uh, for Procedure C. Uh, any standard gauge 20-mile-long railways that want to re-gauge to 15-inch gauge will definitely get a thumbs up from me. In all cases where Procedure C is applied, Procedure B will always be applied to all business units, even if it was not identified that other departments might be affected. This is to ensure that positive responses are obtained from all other managers of the business units that no new or significantly altered risks have been identified to their business units. The lead manager will appoint the independent competent person. And I've picked up on two words here, and I think I have... Uh, sort of illustrated this already, but here it is in black and white. Independence. The person does not have to be independent from the company. They can be an internal person, but they must be independent of the project, not involved in its promotion or design or installation or testing. So you might have to demonstrate their independence, especially if you choose somebody from inside the company. But that is, uh, it's not the exact wording, but that is definitely what the documents linked to above say. That's just not just my opinion, um, that it, the independent competent person can be an internal person, and, it, and in many cases it would be appropriate uh, for them to be. But just as easily it can be an external person. Competent. The primary focus of the person's competence will be their ability to manage the safety aspects of the change and second, their skills in the technical task being changed. E.g. the best steam engine maintainer may not have the best understanding of the safety verification and documentation aspects of building a new steam engine. And I, if I'm honest, I deliberately wrote that sentence because I can think of quite a number of excellent steam engine maintainers um, who are really good at everything mechanical and will have the engine running perfectly sweetly and if there's a fault they will repair it instantly and you cannot knock them on how they maintain a steam engine. But in many cases and by their own admission they will say I just do not understand the paperwork, I do not understand processes, I don't want to get involved in all that stuff, I just like maintaining the steam engine. And as long as the work that they are doing maintaining the steam engine is actually following the processes, there's no getting away from that, um, it's it may well be the case that they're not an appropriate person to choose for their competence as an ICP um, and that somebody who has better 
ability to manage the safety aspects of the change rather than the technical task being changed uh, is a more appropriate appointment. I hope I haven't offended anyone by saying all that. The person should have good knowledge of the application of the safety verification process and other safety legislation and regulations in general. The ICP will be appointed in writing and will be given access to all the documentation and information relating to the proposed change. This would usually include, and this is from ROGS, as you can see I put the little um, reference down the bottom here, ROG Schedule 411C, documents used in designing and setting out a specification for the project, certificates of conformity for materials used, any other risk assessment and safety analysis reports, evidence that the project meets the relevant standards... Remember what we said about standards? The word relevant there is relevant, haha, um, that not every mainline standard is relevant, but some may be. Um, and an explanation of how risk will be managed where the project does not meet standards, and evidence that you have worked with other relevant duty holders to make sure your projects work together. Now, that is obviously a bullet point much more uh, aimed at mainline uh, duty holders. But certainly if we're a heritage railway with a mainline connection and this project is going to make some change to that mainline connection or its method of operation, then probably Network Rail, or maybe Transport for Wales, will be the other relevant duty holder. You could also extend that to non-railway duty holder equivalents. Certainly if you're making changes regarding level crossings or public accesses or things like that, um, then the highway authority or the local council or whoever it is, whoever the appropriate authority is, would... would be the equivalent of, of that bullet point. The lead manager and the ICP will work together on a written scheme of safety verification that complies with ROGS and robustly demonstrates that risks associated with the change are being managed. Um, the written scheme of verification will include an overview of the project, processes to be followed to manage risk arising from the change and results of the change, structure for evaluating aspects of risks, and new or significantly altered risks identified and rationales. The ICP will be required to assess and monitor the methods the project uses, whether the project is being designed and put in place safely, and whether tests are being carried out safely and in line with agreed standards and conditions. David has asked, well done David, you're doing an excellent job today, uh, Will your project change risks involved with visiting locos or stock? Um, so, well, I think um, I understand. Is this related to if visiting locos or stock are going to come to your railway, does that constitute a change? And I would say that if you haven't had that locos or rolling stock before and you don't have experience of managing the risks of it, then yes, it definitely counts as a change. If you're a railway that doesn't have resident steam engines and then you get a visiting steam engine, that is a massive, massive change to the risks that you are used to uh, dealing with. If you only have tank engines and then suddenly you get a tender engine, or if just the nature of the engine that you're getting, even if it's a steam engine and you're used to having steam engines, is different. Or our ah, air brakes is another good thing. Railways generally, most railways have vacuum brakes and suddenly you get an air brake diesel engine in for a gala and it's the only time you've run a, an air brake train that year. Definitely management of change applies, maybe even all the way up to procedure C. But I would say that if you've got somebody in the company who's got um, experience of air brake trains, or let's say more than one person, so that one person can work out what you're going to do and the other person can verify, perhaps they've got that experience from their mainline work, then you can manage it all internally. But as we said right at the start, the amount of management of change and the amount of safety verification should be proportional to the risk. A different braking system, massive high risk. Uh, a slightly different steam engine to the one you're used to, maybe only a minor bit of risk, maybe it can be managed under procedure A. Um, oh, I see, David. Thank you very much. You need to work with a relevant duty holder that supplies them. Yes, absolutely. So this was going back to uh, evidence you have worked with other relevant duty holders to make sure your projects work together. Yes, of course. That's a really good point, is that not only will you be affecting your own uh, change by having this engine on your railway, but there is a duty holder that sent it to you. Um, who you will need to evidence that you have worked with uh, to make sure that you're managing your project safely. Brilliant. Uh, I'm not going to read anything about uh, the actions of GW Brakes uh, on a recorded uh, Teams meeting that uh, could get used against me. 
So the ICP will make sure that the design of the project meets the relevant standards. Any safety critical parts are suitably designed and built. The project has been built, installed and tested properly and arrangements are in place for the project to be run and maintained. And most of these bullet points, which are all from ROGS or from the ORR, um, refer to infrastructure and rolling stock and things like that because clearly they're the most risky things, but they apply just as much to any change that uh, is going to take place. The verification assessment would usually involve physically inspecting or reviewing documents related to things such as designs, specifications, certificates, compliance of products with relevant safety law and how contractors were used in the project. Recommendations from the ICP and actions arising from the assessment will be communicated to other affected managers by the lead manager and although that sentence might just seem a little bit sort of random it's because ROG schedule 414B says you must describe how recommendations from the ICP are going to be communicated to other affected managers so we have given the responsibility to the lead manager here. Before the change is implemented or brought into use, the railway must obtain the outcome of the ICP's assessment in writing, including any recommendations, because if you don't get it then, you will never get it. Right, and finally, you'll be pleased to know we are at the end. <coughs> Excuse me. Post-change, after the change has taken place, the lead manager will conduct a review, which will include the effectiveness of the new arrangements in reducing risk compared to the old arrangements, whether the implementation of the change went to plan, whether any unforeseen risks arose during the change or have arisen since the implementation of the change, whether there are any lessons to be learned for similar future activities or the process of managing the risks of change. And, of course, if you do identify that there are lessons to be learned, you will immediately submit a safety circular so that other railways can learn from them as well. The review will take place at a time period after the implementation of the change agreed with the general manager because clearly the nature of the change and how much risk it involves will affect that time period and you might even want to have more than one review. Certainly if you're opening a three mile extension to your railway to a brand new station and it's got facilities and booking offices and water columns and signal box and all those things then maybe a review after the first day would be appropriate and then maybe after the first couple of weeks and then maybe after three months and then maybe after a year or something like that as some risks take time to manifest themselves and we don't want to miss those by having the review too early and some risks become apparent immediately and we don't want to waste time in managing and mitigating them uh, by waiting six months before we have a review. And I'm pretty sure you'll be pleased to know that that is the end. That is the end of this humongous change management document. But as I said right at the start, I hope you will agree that, where is it where it says what it does, <laughs> that it enables changes to be made and decisions to be made at the appropriate level but still ensures that if there is going to be significant new or altered risk or people involved outside the department that it goes up to the appropriate height in the uh, organisational structure and that the decision is made at the appropriate level. It is not designed to stop ahead of... I'll use signalling because it's all I know. <laughs> it's not designed to stop the head of signalling moving the train register desk from one side of the signal box to the other or deciding that the clipboards will go over there instead of over here or anything like that. It's designed to make sure that when little changes take place by heads of departments, that it may only be the case of saying, yes, we have considered that it doesn't affect anyone else, it doesn't involve any new or significantly changed risk, I'll do my little risk assessment, which might only be a few lines long, and then I shall make the change. But if the change is going to be more significant and it's going to involve people from other departments, then those other departments and those managers of business units are involved in the consultation, and that if it involves new or significantly altered risk, then it goes to procedure C, and I'm afraid there's no getting away from that because that is what it says in ROGS, that if it's new or significantly altered risks, you must conduct safety verification. And I think we're all a little bit guilty um, of probably having some changes in our organisations in the past that do involve new or significantly altered risks, and we haven't really followed the safety verification process. That's not to say we've done it unsafely, it's just to say we haven't got it verified and therefore we wouldn't be able to demonstrate it. The safety verification process in itself does not need to be onerous and it can be an internal person as long as they are suitably independent and suitably competent. 
Right, well, we've reached the end of the template document, so now's your last opportunity to ask any questions or make any comments uh, that you want to, uh, and I'll do my best to answer them. I'll upload the Word document template to HOPS after a short period of time to allow um, last-minute changes to take place, and then if you're an advanced HOPS organisation, you'll be able to download it uh, and take whatever you want out of the document, from all of it to just one sentence. If you're not an advanced HOPS organisation, then I'm afraid you cannot do that. You are welcome to laboriously copy down the text by reading it off the screen. Um, but, you know, of course, the best course of action would be to become an advanced HOPS uh, organisation and get all the benefits uh, that you enjoy uh, by being an advanced HOPS uh, organisation. Thank you so much to everybody that fed into this um, uh, change management system. I've just noticed the heading is still wrong. <laughs> there we go, change management system. Um, thank you very much to everybody who's fed into this change management uh, system document. It's been quite a difficult one to write. It's a really difficult one to strike the balance on because, as I kept saying, we don't want to make it too onerous for little changes, but we don't want big changes to sneak through uh, without the proper safety verification uh, process taking place. So I'm really grateful to everyone that's fed into it. If there's anything that you um, uh, think of afterwards, or if you're not watching this live, if you're watching it um, on YouTube uh, later or as a podcast or when you're in bed and you should be asleep and you think of anything or there's anything that I've said that you think mm, that's not quite right or we've got a better system for that then please please do write in I will change the document you can be anonymous if you want uh, and then I'll share it with everybody else to make sure that everybody gets the benefit uh, and that all railways can share in your best practice. So, all that remains for me to say is thank you very much. Thank you very much to everybody who's taken part in the last 30 workshops. I think it's taken us about three years to get this far. Um, it's been really great, and I think it's helped a lot of railways. Um, I imagine especially the smaller railways, I hope they won't mind me saying, um, who maybe don't have the background or the level of workforce to enable them to do some of this stuff, and having some of these templates uh, just to enable them to know where to start, um, I feel has been really helpful, and I, and I hope you do too. Workshops will be back uh, in the new year. We will um, probably change the format slightly. Maybe we'll move on a little bit from SMSs to something else. I don't quite know what, but I'm all ears on what your views of that might be. But since we've had quite a lot of these SMS workshops now, uh, it might be time uh, to alter the focus again slightly. So I'll be back in the new year. Oh, one thing I do know for the new year is that it won't be HOPS SMS workshops anymore. It'll be uh, Heritage Railway Safety Service uh, workshops. So you can look forward to that. I will now say goodbye. I hope you all have a lovely Christmas and I'll see you in the new year. I think that's the first time the number of people watching the video has gone up during the end music. But, well done for staying till the end. Well done for listening to all the music. I do have a present for you this time. Since it's Christmas and since you've stayed to the end of the music, 
if you send your name and address to shop at heritageops.org.uk, I will send you your very own Santa Express Happy Christmas key ring, which I've got thousands of here in the shop, and one of them could be yours as your reward for listening all the way to the end of the music. I will reserve the right to cut off this offer at some time in the future. I might make it tomorrow or I might make it the next day just in order to give people who uh, watch the follow-up an opportunity. But if you're watching this in three years' time, then the offer no longer stands. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful Christmas. I'll see you all again soon. Good night.